The Samurai As one of the most legendary warrior classes in history, samurai are a staple of pop culture and high culture alike. Because of their popularity, we know a lot about the samurai. But some of the more obscure things are pretty dark. Here are messed up facts about the samurai. History explains that seppuku is a ritualistic suicide method where a samurai slices his stomach open with a small sword. Ever since it emerged in the 12th century as an honorable method for losing samurai to die on the battlefield, Japan has wrought all sorts of abdominal slicing doom upon its elite warrior class. According to Thought Co., there were two basic ways of doing the deed. The more awful variation had the performer cut his abdomen open with a vertical and a horizontal cut, then wait for death in excruciating pain. However, most opted for the softer variants where a helper decapitated them immediately after the first cut. Outside the battlefield, seppuku was an elaborate process, where the participants made a day out of it with rituals such as the writing of a death poem and having a good drink of sake before grabbing the blade. Usually, there were even spectators present. Samurai warriors could perform seppuku as a political protest or to show their overwhelming grief after the death of a beloved leader. It was also a form of death sentence. Shoguns and daimyos could command their underlings to perform seppuku for real or perceived slights, at which point the person had to follow through or else he'd bring shame to himself and his entire family. Bushido Code is one of the first things many people associate with the noble samurai, but is it really what we think it is? Not quite, according to Dr. Henry Smith of Columbia University. The original Bushido was just one of the assorted warrior guidelines in Japan's history. Their values often included things like fighting spirits, skill, duty, honor, loyalty, and self-sacrifice, but focused on different things and were still pretty martial. Since Bushido is the one we know today, surely it was just the code that won some sort of samurai ethics tournament to become the one everyone started to follow. According to Dr. Smith, again, nope. When the Meiji Restoration of 1868 ended the Edo period and essentially abolished the samurai class, samurai warrior values steered the loyalty aspect from the samurai's immediate master to a more generalized appreciation of the emperor and nation. The 1899 book Bushido The Soul of Japan is arguably the most influential description of this reimagined Bushido in modern Japan, which is ironic because the book was aimed at Western readers and retooled Bushido as a largely non-militaristic take on Western chivalry. Instead of samurai, this new Bushido is for everyone in the Japanese society and focuses on the positive aspects of a loyal, humble, brave, and hardworking citizen. As Japan Guide notes, the samurai really started flourishing during the Edo period, between 1603 and 1867, when they rose to the upper echelons of Japan's society and became the highest caste. However, their higher-than-ever social status didn't mean they were free to do whatever they felt like, at least when it came to marriage. According to Hisako Hata, curator of the Edo Tokyo Museum, marriages of the Edo era were generally prearranged, and young members of the samurai class had it particularly bad. Apart from having their parents essentially choose from a spouse from whatever family was deemed socially appropriate, they also needed the local authorities to consent before they could marry that virtual stranger in the first place. This system made love marriages extremely rare, but that didn't mean people still didn't fall in love. As a result, some young, desperate lovers would commit suicide together when it became evident that their parents had other plans for their marital future. Katana swords are at least as cool and legendary as their historical samurai wielders, and they've held a lot of ceremonial sway over the years. However, a katana is still a sword, which means it had to be tested before the swordsmith presented it to its samurai owner. According to Vintage News, the testing was an elaborate process called tameshigiri, or test cut. This put both the sword and its user's skill to the test by cutting into materials such as bamboo, wood, or armor, and if either the katana or the man swinging it weren't up to the task, the sword could quite easily be ruined. Tameshigiri is still practiced today, but one dark subsection of the practice has hopefully gone the way of the dodo, testing swords on actual human bodies. The bodies were usually those of dead criminals, but using corpses didn't make the process any less gruesome, especially as a mutilation count was sometimes inscribed on the sword as a creepy seal of quality. Apart from the masterless ronin drifters, the samurai class isn't usually associated with poverty. However, the fact that they were at the top of feudal Japan's food pyramid didn't necessarily mean they controlled vast amounts of wealth. According to Japan Times, the Tokugawa shoguns of the Edo period felt that having lots of food and warm clothes would be detrimental to the society, and started pushing towards stoic attitudes in all Japanese classes. This push was so effective that many Japanese either couldn't understand or tried to avoid money, and the samurai in particular took Tokugawa tenants to heart, to the point that they started 
seeing money as too tainted to mess with. Historian Kozo Yamamura writes that most scholars agree on the increasing poverty among the samurai during this era, but the actual extent of their supposed squalor is largely unclear and may have been influenced by the modern image of the humble, noble samurai. Yamamura doesn't outright debunk the concept of the impoverished Edo samurai, but he does suggest that the quote, increasing poverty could have been due to any number of economic reasons. It could even have been a form of psychological poverty, where the samurai grew so accustomed to their power and wealth that their expectations for income rose higher than their actual income. One of the most terrifying traditions associated with the samurai was sushigiri. The term means roadside killing, and though the practice had its roots in honorable dueling, it eventually twisted into a popular practice where members of the samurai class sneaked around to unexpectedly slash at passing merchants and peasants. Sometimes, there were vague excuses for these gruesome slayings, such as testing out a new weapon or practicing a strike. Other times, it was done simply because the samurai just happened to feel like it. There was even a legend floating around that performing a thousand sushigiri killings could cure illness. All in all, it was not a great time to walk out at night if you were a merchant or peasant. Encyclopedia of Japanese Swords says that sushigiri ultimately became such a massive problem that the newly empowered Tokugawa officials prohibited it in 1602. Even then, the custom didn't exactly go away overnight. Regular instances of sushigiri were reported well into the Edo period, to the point that even the third Tokugawa shogun was rumored to often sneak out of the Edo castle to chop up passersby on the dark streets of his city. All things must come to an end, and HistoryNet says Japan's feudal system sang its swan song on a battlefield near Kagoshima on September 25, 1877. The country has been moving toward modern times, aided in no small part by none too subtle hints from the superior military might of the U.S. Traditional samurai had resisted change because it stripped them of their previous power, and there had been several unsuccessful revolts. Now, only the Satsuma clan samurai and their leader Takamori Saigo remain, and Saigo's initial attempts at peaceful negotiations with the government government had descended into violence. This was a problem because the government had sent 30,000 soldiers to face him. Saigo had 500 men who were so short on supplies that they had to melt trinkets into bullets, and their only medical supplies were a carpenter's saw and some rags. As the Imperial Army was hammering his positions with lethal artillery fires, Saigo resigned himself to his fate and had a final sake party with his closest friends. Early in the morning of September 25th, the Imperials stormed the samurai positions. Three hours later, only 40 of Saigo's men were alive, and the samurai leader himself was mortally wounded. Saigo had his follower Shinsuke Beppu take him to an appropriately nice hilltop spot and behead him. After this, Beppu and the remaining samurai drew their swords and charged the enemy gunfire. None survived. Nowadays, we talk about adding insult to injury, but the samurai like to approach this concept the other way around. As the Encyclopedia of Japanese Swords tells us, a practice known as Kirisute Gomen allowed them to legally kill people who they felt were disrespecting them, as long as they did it immediately after the supposed insult happened, and the victim was of a lower social class. The insult and retaliation needed to be seen by a witness who could recount the events in front of a court, though the samurai were allowed to use their own servants and friends as witnesses. So did every samurai have a blank check to kill almost any merchant or peasant who looked at them in a funny way or made fun of their socks and sandals combo? Such a mild insult. Well, not exactly. There were actually serious repercussions for anyone caught abusing this system. A samurai who was found to misuse his Kirisute Goman privileges was given a severe punishment, which could be a shameful death by beheading, and his house being abolished so his sons couldn't inherit his title and position. Ouch. What does a warrior do during a period of peace? Well, if he's a samurai, he might start wearing outlandish clothing, get a rebel haircut, and join a themed street gang to terrorize common folks and clash with other gangs. You know, like in the movie Warriors. Warriors, come out to play! According to Law and Order in the Age of the Samurai, the lack of respect and also the lack of wars to fight drove some bored and unemployed Edo period samurai out on the streets, where they joined with other highborn kids to form gangs such as the Kabukimono and the Kyokaku. Kabukimono were a flamboyant group that eschewed traditional samurai behavior in favor of strange clothes, deliberately debauched behavior, and strange slang. Their behavior was that of a stereotypical 1980s movie gang in that they roamed the streets harassing townspeople, wreaking havoc, and brawling with other gangs. Kyokaku, or street knights, were one of those other gangs and the natural enemy of the Kabukimono. They were vigilantes who were comprised of samurai and lower-class townspeople alike and were nominally protecting the people. 
The Kyokaku carried extra long swords, shaved their traditional sideburns all the way up to the temple, and marked their allegiance with expensive fabrics worn draped over the shoulder or as neckerchiefs. Cool and mysterious as their vigilante antics might have seemed, Kyokaku were basically just another group of street thugs, and the violent clashes between them, Kabukimono, and other factions provided the Edo period with a hefty helping of bloody gang violence. Everything must end eventually, and as Japan times attests, the samurai faced the music during a period known as Meiji Restoration. When the last Tokugawa shogun died in 1853 with no follower in sight, Japan plunged into a long period of turmoil that destroyed the shogunate and gave rise to Emperor Meiji, who took the throne in 1868. Meiji's government started steering the country toward modern times by opening up to industrialization and Western influences and stripping away the samurai's powers. The Meiji Restoration left an estimated two-thirds of the samurai class without a job. The remaining samurai were somewhat more fortunate as they were hired in new bureaucratic positions and found a new purpose as facilitators of Japan's social change. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.